Hello, hello. Um, Y'all, it is so amazing to be here with you all. I have had an amazing afternoon and morning and evening, and um, I'm looking for so much more, looking forward to so much more um, out of our time together. I, I want to first start off by saying I am deeply appreciative to everybody who's had their hands in this conference, to the invite, first of all, but also just to all the hands that went into making this event such an amazing success. I feel like we are part of a conversation and we are part of a movement that is so unique and it's really one of those moments that I feel where we know that we're sitting at the intersection of a moment where we know we have finally gotten to a place where we can actually transform our society through our work with cannabis and through our work in social justice. And so my hope is, yes. And so my hope is to engage us in a deeper conversation about race, racism, society, and our future. But really, I also want to challenge us to understand the deeper implications um, of Black Lives Matter. Because many people know my, you know, my work as a co-founder of Black Lives Matter. But really, the, the reality is for what we wanted and what we need is to understand that race and racism shows up in every sphere of our lives and in every industry. And so we have to engage in courageous conversations that invite us to take on these challenging issues in our time, but also invite us to be our best selves. And that's what I'm hoping that we can do here today. But I don't only come to you with my kind of movement builder hat on and my work and you know, the various awards that we've won. I mean, we've, we've done some incredible things over the years, and I, I want to give a shout out to the network and to all the organizations that I've had the pleasure of building with. You know, we won the Sydney Peace Prize. Yes, it was like the Sydney Peace Prize. It's next to the Nobel Peace Prize, so it's, it's not a bad look, all right? For, it's not a bad look, it's a good thing. But it also tells us something about the multiracial nature of our racial justice movement. It tells us that there are multiple hands that have been on deck, multiple people who know what is going on, and tens of millions of people around the world who understand what time it is. And so I'm just happy to be alive and to be doing my part to contribute to our social movements but also to be doing my part in expanding our conversations, expanding the venues in which we're having our conversations about race and racism. Now, today I come to this conversation and this particular dialogue um, with the multiple hats on. So one, as a consumer of cannabis, right? Um, the lip gloss I just put on had a little cushion in it, you know, the tinctures. I, <laughs> the tinctures from this morning when I um, had to take some for some inflammation and some chronic health issues that I'm dealing with and beyond. But I'm also an investor. I invest in the industry in many different ways. I also consult, and I'm also looking at the various means for which more people like me and more people within our social movements can also participate and see and reap the benefits of this great medicine. And then I come to you also as an advocate, of course, you know, as a social justice activist and somebody who's been working in movements for many decades now. And, and all, honestly and ultimately as a truth teller. That is my mandate today, every day. It's just kind of what we do and what we need to do now. And I'm here to tell the truth about cannabis and about this industry, tell the truth about the contradictions that exist within this industry, tell the truth about the ways in which this race for weed is actually forgetting about race. And also, not only that we're forgetting about race, but there is a racialization of marijuana that has taken place over the last century, and it's changed. It changes with each decade, and it morphs just like racism does and how it appears. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a story about the racialization and the morphing of race um, when it comes to marijuana. Um, and it starts off kind of like this. Well, well, first, let me say this. How many of you are aware of the three M's that are showing up in media right now? The three M's, does that sound familiar? No? So I'll tell you. 
We got marijuana, we got Mexicans, and we got migration. And these are the three M's that seem to be so ever-present on the tips of the tongues of so many in our media and in our politics. But how many of you are aware that the history, of the history of marijuana in the United States started in large part because of Mexican migration? Some people are aware. Okay, yeah, yeah, you got some nods, people's hands up, okay, yeah. So I'm a bit of an immigration nerd and an expert. I used to lead the nation's first immigrant rights organization for people of African descent. And so I study this stuff. And the reality is, almost 100 years ago, after the Mexican Revolution, there was an influx of migrants that landed in Texas and Louisiana. And of course, naturally, with all migration, we bring our customs, our traditions, our language, you know, different types of things. And one of these customs was that of cannabis, right? Mexicans were using cannabis uh, for its medicinal purposes as well as for relaxation. They referred to this plant as marijuana. I don't know if my accent's right, but I tried, okay? <laughs> marijuana, right? I tried. Um, and so Americans, right, U.S. Americans, were familiar with the term cannabis, but not so much marijuana. And so what we saw during this period was a proliferation of fake news where they were labeling Mexicans as being disruptive, as causing all sorts of damage, and they were labeling them in this way by associating their behavior with marijuana. Right? And this was actually an effort to control and regulate migration. This was an effort to actually deport and to detain Mexicans. But they were using marijuana as their entry point into this conversation and into this action of criminalizing uh, migration and criminalizing Mexicans in particular. Now, does this sound familiar? <laughs> does all of this like, you know, all of this boogeyman talk about Mexicans and migrations and drugs and women and this and that. Sound familiar? Yeah. yeah, I feel like we're in the same time, right? Where we are having this same type of rhetoric proliferate our media cycle, our news cycle, but we're here. We're in 2019 and it's time for us to evolve the conversation. It's time for us to evolve the conversation as we know from one that dispels the myths and the rumors about marijuana being a menace in our society to one that reminds us about the medicine that marijuana is, the power and the ability to transform our lives. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, we have to be aware of the very tragic and horrendous origins of the prohibition of, the mar of marijuana and how it's evolved today. You know, we can fast forward to today and see how black and brown people are disproportionately arrested for marijuana, even though we already know that white people use marijuana at similar rates. I'm sure you all have already heard the data. People have talked about it earlier and referenced it. And we know that all communities love and benefit from marijuana, right? We love it. We were talking about, we, I mean, literally, we've spoken all day about this, right? Right? Like, we've had panels, we've had songs, <laughs> we've, like, practically meditated on it. Um, and we've talked about the myriad benefits, right? From the healing aspects to the aspects that um, deal with anxiety to the aspects that deal with all sorts of trauma that our communities have experienced over the years. And as I mentioned, I even took some CBD this morning to deal with some inflammation from an injury that I uh, had almost four or five years ago that I'm still dealing with. I had surgery, it hasn't healed up, and every day I'm dealing with swelling. And so it's important to me, and I think it's important to many of us for a number of reasons. We talked also about the potential, right? We talked about flow state and the ability we have to transform our very beings to to perform at our optimal state. And that is, I feel, so profound, so necessary, and where I hope that we can all move. Now, I want to share a few statistics and data with, with you all, um, and I hope you all don't mind because I'm going to get a little wonky with it. But I want to remind us that truly the difference in the rate and the use of weed 
between whites and black people and other people of color really in this country is really negligible. Yet the difference in the rate of arrests, prosecutions, and convic convictions is enormous. According to data from the American Civil Liberties Union, they've said that in the states with the largest disparities, black people were six times more likely than white people to get arrested for marijuana. Six times more likely. Y'all, black people are only 14% of the population. 14%. So this doesn't even make sense. These types of disparities are so deeply related to ways in which our socioeconomic status and our socioeconomic outcomes in this society are so abysmal. You see the correlation play out. And what I find rather odd, too, is that the ACLU conduct another series of studies where they, they ask people how they identified and how often that they use weed. And they reported back that black people self-reported using weed less than their white counterparts. So all of this, uh, the data that we're hearing, all the disparities, all of the mass incarceration that we're seeing across the United States, we see it intimately, intimately related back to the racial profiling, the, race, the racialization, and then the consequential criminalization of communities of color through marijuana and other substances. Now, for those of us who are concerned with migration, and I hope all of us are, um, marijuana possession accounted for the fourth most common cause of deportation of any offense in 2013. There's some more reports that are coming out, but this is the most recent study that we've been able to find. And the most common cause of deportation under any drug law was for marijuana. And about 84% of the more than 2,000 marijuana offenders who were federally sentenced in 2018 were people of color, right? This is just last year. 84% were people of color, according to the U.S. Sentencing Commission. And only 11% were white, even though white people make up more than 60% of the U.S. Popula population. So, with all of this unequal, quote-unquote, justice that's happening, we've seen a really incredible and courageous and vibrant movement emerge to transform our society, to call attention to the injustice of the locking up of black and brown people and the disproportionate impacts that it has on our communities. Not only just because we're locking people up, but we have to look at the families and the ripple effect around our society. Right, people, young people are being raised without their family members. Families are having to pay exorbitant fees to, call, to make sure that their loved ones can call them. Right? There are all sorts of ways in which this incarceration or this hyper-incarceration of people of color is impacting our lives. And the movement to decriminalize the use of marijuana has grown and is incredible. But the reality is that people of color have been left out of formal economies and have had to turn to these industries over the years in order to make a living. And right now what we're also seeing is that it's hard for communities of color to access these same types of job opportunities in this industry. Oftentimes because of their record, you know, if they're a criminal record, they aren't able to access these job opportunities. They aren't able to access job programs. They aren't able to engage in the same economy that led them to be behind bars. So this contradiction is stark and it exists and it's something that we have to deal with. Are any of you aware that some people have quite literally had life imprisonment because of a marijuana offense? Are some of you all aware? Yeah, it's, the situation's dire. Some people are still locked up behind bars right now because of those types of laws. And this didn't happen with Trump, as much as we like to blame him <laughs> for a number of things, and he is to blame for a lot, right? But he's also the product of this whole thing. But we have you know, Bush Sr., we have Clinton, we have they, the, the collusion that happened to ramping up our criminal, or sorry, our prison industrial complex that allowed for the hyper-policing of communities of color, 
right? When people think about movements that I am so deeply connected with and a part of, like Black Lives Matter, they wonder, you know, why is this happening? Why, why all of these extrajudicial killings of unarmed black people? And it's actually directly connected to some of these presidents, right? These leaders who chose to criminalize our communities instead of putting education and improving education in our communities, instead of looking at housing programs, they cut and gut the public safety net. And instead, they uh, increased the criminalization that was in our community. And these are part of why our communities are challenged and reeling with the impact of police brutality and mass incarceration today. So thankfully, the movement has grown, as I said. And now we have marijuana that is legal in many different states. We have you know, 11 states, including the District of Columbia. And 33 states have legalized medical marijuana in some form. And California has been a leader. <laughs> yes, y'all, y'all are amazing, right? So I am based between New York and DC, but my organization also was founded in Oakland, California. And so I've been doing work around California for over 15 years, yes. And we've been part of many coalitions to win some of the incredible victories that we've had here. So to legalize and regulate marijuana in the state, for, you know, Prop 19 in California, right, in 2010, um, that paved the way for the victories in Washington, D.C., in Colorado, then of course 2014 victories. There's been so much momentum and so much inspiration that California has offered around the country. Um, I would be remiss if I close, I'm, I'm looking and I see I got the time, but that we need to celebrate and collaborate and contribute to communities of color in the industry. We need to be sure to partner with them. We have many people even in this conference, right, who are doing that work. We just heard from Kareem, right? We have um, so many others who are here. And so I just encourage you all to reach out and to speak to those in the industry who are working specifically with communities of color because we have a unique opportunity. We know that there is a $45 billion potential in revenue by 2024, right? With all cannabinoid sales, that's what they're saying. Ointments, supplements, you name it. It's looking like a multi-billion dollar industry. And we are dealing with these contradictions and how they disproportionately impact black and brown people. But we do have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to uplift those who have suffered the most at the hands of criminalization those who have suffered the most for the lack of legalization of marijuana. And I believe that it is actually our responsibility to do right, to seek what is just, and to repair the damage that has been done to communities of color across the country. And I believe that California is already leading the way, but can continue to be an example to those of us across the country. Now, um, some of you all might have heard about the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act. It was just introduced by Jerry Nadler and Kamala Harris, and it is quite literally the most sweeping marijuana reform bill ever in Congress. It would deschedule marijuana at the federal level to let states set their own policies without interference and to begin to repair the extensive damage that has been done by prohibition. Uh, furthermore, it will go in to prioritize and reinvest in those communities that have been infected unjustly by these failed mar marijuana laws. There are a number of other things that it'll do, but I can't get into all the details, but I want to emphasize that there is one important aspect that it will create a trust fund. It is a trust fund that will have four distinct <coughs> functions. One it would administer a newly created Office of Cannabis Justice to give grants to communities negatively impacted by the war on drugs for the development of expungement programs, um, processes for employment and re-entry guidance, youth justice programs, and so much more. So that's one aspect of this. The second aspect of the fund would be for substance use treatment. So people who might have an issue with substance use, let them get treatment if they need. The third is that it will administer a small business administration program to encourage socially and economically disadvantaged communities to enter the cannabis industry. 
And then lastly, it will create an equitable licensing program in the states and local governments that benefit communities most impacted by prohibition. And this small fund will come out of the taxes from this new uh, reform bill. So I encourage all of us as leaders and as people who are in the actual business to leverage your power. That is what we have. We've seen corporations and other types of businesses leverage their power to change policies and to change laws and neck laws that benefit them, right? And it also criminalize, sometimes criminalize communities of color. But we actually have an opportunity to be the champions of these types of progressive reforms that allow for more of our communities to engage in acts of social justice, to engage and participate in these industries that our communities have been systematically left out of and have been systematically told that we were bad and we were wrong and that we were criminals for engaging in. California can truly be a leader. And it's imperative that we are in order to save, right? In order to quite literally save this democracy. We need this democracy to work for all of us. And I actually believe that marijuana and this cannabis industry can be one of the critical vehicles for the 21st century to help us in transforming this world to, so that we can have a democracy that works for all of us. I believe that we have an opportunity for us to live up to the change that we talked about. We talked about you know, this conference and even this convening being one that is a, recognizing that cannabis is a catalyst for change. And I believe that cannabis can be a catalyst for social change and social good. So that is where I will close. <laughs> to do that. Thank you.